it was really awkward at first because like logically I understood that like, oh, I'm Latina, I'm, I'm multiracial, but what does that mean? All I knew was like a lot of racist beliefs from my childhood and knowing that those things were wrong. And I didn't know like what was real, like what were like aspects of the culture other than like speaking Spanish and reggaeton. I didn't even like, I didn't even have rice and beans. I literally had nothing <laughs> from my cultural ties. So it started off small. One of the things that a lot of transracial adoptees have in common with like biracial and multiracial people is that feeling of like, I am too much of this, but not enough of that. Hi, I'm Gina. And I'm Courtney. And welcome, welcome to, to the, the Hey There, there Parenthood, Parenthood podcast. podcast. Hey There, Parenthood is a podcast that fosters a diverse, inclusive village for raising confident and loved children. I am so excited about our episode today. Me too. We have Melissa, who I've been following for like, what, four or five years now, and she's going to be on the episode, and we're going to be talking about adoption, um, transracial adoption, even being, um, I'm trying to, I don't remember the right term for it, but like finding out you're adopted. Like a late, late fine? discovery? Big discovery. No, you're right. That's Listen right. Listen to the episode and you'll hear Melissa say it. <laughs> <laughs> like late discovery adopt, adoption or adoptee. And like, I, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, to ima imagine just finding like you're a different race oh my goodness, not only am I a different race, I was adopted. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a lot for any person to find out at a later life. Like, you're having to find out who you are. Yeah. And, I mean, I couldn't imagine what Melissa went through, and I'm so excited to hear from her today. Yeah, me too, and especially because she's going to share with us like as an educator standpoint so not just as an adopt adoptee mm -hmm. what was her experience but also like now that she's chosen to go the route of telling other people sharing her experience how do we make this a safer more empowering space for all parties i think she's going to speak to that also and i'm just i'm thrilled and hope that listeners are ready to learn from her and with her not only <laughs> listeners especially adopt a parent yeah because i know i've learned how to become a better parent but a better adoptive parent listening to adopt and I know it's hard for adoptive parents to be like, oh, but like, I'm, you know, I'm just trying my best. And like trying your best also means learning that you may make mistakes. We're not perfect. And we should be listening to people who like our child is a child right now. They're going to grow up. And wouldn't you want someone to listen to your child if they were expressing some lack of like needs or support that they weren't able to like Nothing makes me hurt more thinking about all these adoptees who are speaking out, trying to make it better for future adoptees, mm -hmm. and they're being ignored because people can't seem to sit with what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. So it may be a challenging conversation, but hopefully a really, really helpful one. We're mm -hmm. thrilled. Thrilled to have her. I'm really excited because, you know, we started this new segment, and a lot of someone even messaged like they love our new segment. So oh, thank yay. you. <laughs> All right, so I'm supposed to be sharing something that I found really interesting this week, and I'm going to share, I'm going to like have you guys listen to the TikTok, because I listened to it, and I was like, oh, that makes complete sense, but also, I don't know if a lot of people know about this, I feel like I'm just like rambling on, but essentially, it's talking about how your birth order should determine or can it really influence who you marry or how well your marriage oh. will fare. Or how well it will do. And so, like, a middle child cannot marry a middle child. Because they, what, have the same tendencies? Like, they don't balance or something? I think so. Okay. Like, this is, I'm uh, oldest. Okay. At least, yeah, I'm the oldest. And Drew's the youngest. And I think it shouldn't be like that, right? So, let's just listen. Let's just listen to what she says. Because I thought it was really interesting. Here, let's see if this will open up on TikTok. Anybody else, whenever you try to open something, all of a sudden it'll just open um in a like webs like the, the browser Safari, yes. the, the explore. Yes. Explore. Like, remember? <laughs> I am in the know of internet stuff. <laughs> Safari Explorer. <laughs> oh my gosh. Most... Here, let me see. But right now, there we go. First born's married to first born's. It's actually based on studies looking at how birth order can impact marital success. A Norwegian study highlighted that unions of individuals with different birth orders is actually generally more successful than unions of individuals with the same birth order. And this likely feeds into other research suggesting that birth order impacts personality. 
Dr. Kevin Lehman is a former family counsellor who wrote an article called How Birth Order Affects Marriage. According to Lehman, he said the general rule of thumb is that firstborns rule, middleborns mediate, and lastborns charm. And for that reason, you tend uh-huh. to see a higher divorce rate in people who are both firstborns because they potentially butt heads. The one divorce rate that is higher than a firstborn with a firstborn is an only child with an only child. Studies and data suggest that having siblings actually reduces a person's risk of divorce. When you're an only child, potentially you're used to being centre of attention. And when you get with another only child, you're both fighting for that attention. So although I started this video saying the most successful marriages are when a firstborn marries a lastborn, yeah, that is true. But to be ultra specific, it's actually when a firstborn sister of brothers marries a lastborn brother of sisters. Oh my gosh! So rate, the highest divorce rate is only child married to only child, followed by firstborn married to firstborn. The lowest divorce rate is youngest child married to oldest child, and in between you have the middle and middle and middle and lastborn and lastborn. Uh, what <laughs> okay so really right now what i'm hearing is not only do the studies to show that uh black women who marry white men oh, you're stacked like <laughs> least amount of divorce right we're not the like lowest of lowest right but then add on top of the fact that i'm oldest the oldest and, youngest. and you're the youngest rock solid i'm just saying just we're together be, forever bring that up whenever like you're having <laughs> issues just be like but statistically <laughs> the research shows <laughs> So now I'm trying to figure out, because where is Blake in their family? Blake is number three out of five, so smack in the middle, two older and two younger. So an exact middle child. Okay. Yeah. And then I would consider you as I'm on the upper end, correct, because there's seven kids, and I'm oldest, it feels like it has nuances that I don't quite align with, because I... Like, my older sibling fills that role very strongly and well Mm -hmm. in a lot of the stereotypes, but in a lot of the non-stereotypes, like, she's definitely the oldest. Um, So I don't want to claim that because that's a strong part of her identity and her experience in our family. But, like, on the older end or, like, a lot of traits of being the oldest, I'm number two. So Mm -hmm. there's five below me. Um, And I definitely am, like, an older older sibling Mm -hmm. to the majority of the family members. So a lot of those traits. So I'm a middle with an older end <laughs> i mean oldest I, energy in some things are definitely like leader i definitely think i have mm-hmm. opinions on things know how i want things done i can manage people and situations oh, we know that comes like pretty naturally and but i have a lot of compromise <laughs> elements and so that helps like i think it makes it work <laughs> <laughs> i mean it really it we do i feel like no i don't think you're doomed at all because i think that one i think there's so many other factors oh but my I gosh guess, yeah I mean, they're just looking at studies and they're looking at like data, but like there's so many other things that like play into it that I think is just like what makes it a little bit easier for a relationship, not that and not be all. So we always have to remember that because there's so many other things that come to play. Um, And I think both of you like, like y'all do such a great job. We're rocking and rolling. Yeah, Yeah. Like communicating with each other that I... I mean, I feel like you guys are an inspiration to Drew and I. Oh, like, yeah. You guys are... We've worked on a lot. Yes. <laughs> and, like, it's always, like, I love looking at the both of you because, like, you guys have gone through so much, but the way you communicate with each other is just so beautiful that, like, I mean, I mean even... <laughs> you might laugh at this. Oh, dear. The one time that you guys argued in front of us, like, Drew and I were, like, like ping-pong like this. Like, like what's this. happening? And then I remember telling you, Drew, like... This was like when like mom and dad like are like fighting. <laughs> like it feels like when your parents are fighting. Like, but then now even, what? But no. But even the way you were fighting, like it didn't feel uncomfortable. Like because it was like, oh man, like I, we feel like we should leave. But it's just mostly because it's like, it was just like that was our first time ever hearing you guys like have a disagreement. But like I did not feel like you guys were disrespectful. You guys were so. I mean maybe overly like so like but that's not how i feel i need you to hear me and you're like okay well, yeah we have I do a lot hear of ground you. rules yes. for disagreements and i loved yeah. it because i think a lot of people could learn from that and so again hearing these studies is not the end all be all but i'm just telling you guys right now that drew and i are going to be together forever so if you Shipped. guys are praying for our downfall <laughs> sorry you're data doomed. says the no. research says so we're gonna have melissa on our episode today and again we're so excited because i feel like we're going to learn so much from her her being an educator on adoption i feel like 
even if you're not an adoptive parent, I think it's worth the listen because I know there's so much change that needs to happen in the adoption community that I think people who are not a part of the adoption community, they can help and amplify our voices because we can't have change if it's just the people within our community wanting that change. So we are so glad to have you here today, Melissa. Like we, it's so nice because I think you're like one of our at least first guests that we both have met beforehand. Yes. And so we got to meet last year yes. at Bithia's retreat for kinship and foster like, parents, foster parents and adoptive parents, right? Mm-hmm. And that was the first time. Like we've been friends for a long time on social media. Yeah. Yeah. Like what since 2020, I think. But yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then we met last year, and it's like now I feel like we're we are <laughs> friends, right? We're, yeah. I mean, we were hanging out yesterday. I hope so. Oh, so it's like so nice to like have you here on our show. I was so excited you reached out because I liked how you're like, yeah, I'm coming on, right? I'm like, dude, I already had you on the list. Yes. I was like, I just didn't get to tell you or send you an email yet. Like, you were already on. And so I loved how you were just like, I'm coming on the show. Like, let me know when. And that's why I'm glad because I feel like because we're friends, like, I love that you did that because I would love for any of my friends who are like, hey, I want to come on the show. I'm like, sure, cool. What day works for you? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been great in Georgia so far. And that French toast we had yesterday was delicious. <laughs> so good, right? <laughs> yeah. If you ever come to Georgia, Mama's Boys is like the place to go. Have we taken you there no. yet? No. I'll take you. Sorry. I need to go. And you came at a really good time of year because it's a Georgia spring. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Besides the pollen, the weather is like cannot be beat. Yeah, the allergies definitely hit me, but I I took my allergy meds, so we should be okay. For now. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited to talk to you about what we're gonna talk to you about, mm-hmm. which is <laughs> uh, like a adoptees as adults because i think a lot of us adoptive parents we like know our children and we only see our children as children Mm -hmm. right but we need to obviously think that our well, we obviously know, but sometimes as parents, we can't not think of our babies as being babies. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important to think of them as adults because as they become adults, they're going to express things that we may or probably will do wrong because we're parents, we're not perfect. And I think it's important to see our kids not as children, but as adults. So that way, when they come to us with issues, mm-hmm. that we're willing to listen to them, hear them, and then start making making changes so that way we can continue our relationship as parents and children and not trying to ignore their feelings or um, issues that may come arise when they get older. Yeah, definitely. I, when I'm teaching classes and stuff on adoption, I'm always saying like, get comfortable being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because we're parents are human. We're going to make mistakes no matter if you're a biological parent or an adoptive parent or foster parent. It's just Mm -hmm. life. (laughs) And your main platform is just like as a summary, Gina was saying adoptee thoughts. Is that right? So sharing your own thoughts, but then you mentioned being like facilitating classes or what does it look like to be in the position that you're in to educate people or share your experience? What do you do? Yeah, it's, it's really funny how it kind of came to be. I, started writing about my own personal journey with adoption and after I wrote a HuffPo essay back in 2019 and that went mega viral and I just wasn't prepared for it and then I started realizing that there was like this huge gap in education not just for my parents but for a lot of transracial adoptive parents so um, I ended up writing my first adoption book what white parents should know about transracial adoption and at the same time started building um, my platform adoptee thoughts just to kind of get my name out there build you know community and just connect with other adoptees because I never had that growing up and so gradually after the book came out I was approached by agencies to teach workshops on transracial adoption and so I've been doing that for I think two years now I've done keynotes um, I have my own podcast um, and I just try to dabble in different areas where we can add more nuance to the discussion because I believe every adoptee and every former foster youth like we deserve a place where we can say our piece about adoption because it's much more complicated than the media typically portrays. So that's kind of my mission is just to work together to to kind of keep spearheading more change for a better world for future generations of adoptees and foster youth. Okay. Hold on. Is her mic close enough? Can you hear yeah. her? No, I can hear her fine. Okay. I think because she's kind of angled Okay, I wasn't sure from here. It looks super far away. I'm like, I want people to make sure they're here. Okay. 
So um, I want also want to. I know we know you, but I want our audience to know who you are. And like you've given us like a like a little bit of like a synopsis. But like, can you get, tell us more about like your background? Uh, about who you are and then because we obviously know how you started (laughs) yeah so um i identify as a late discovery transracial international adoptee so those are long fancy terms to just basically explain that i didn't find out that i was adopted until i was 19 years old so anything after i think 11 is considered late discovery adoptee um my parents were white and i am multiracial and latina i was adopted from bogota colombia at about five Five months old and grew up in the suburbs of New York in a very uh, conservative immigrant Italian Portuguese family and when everything kind of came to light that's when I decided to really get into writing and that helped me process my story and it also helped me foster conversations with my parents that we were really struggling to have because there was no guidebook (laughs) back then and it was like a lot of stigma Um, but yes So I am an author, I'm an adoption educator, a speaker, a podcaster, I have my hats in a lot of different Mm -hmm. things. I've been doing content creation now and have found a lot of joy in that and connecting with the adoptee community. Wow, you're doing a lot, like a (laughs) lot. It is a lot because like writing a book is not easy. I remember last year you were telling us that you were writing a book and you're like, yeah, I'm in like the early like process of it. And then hearing you just explain all the things that you have to do before the book is even published, it makes me realize like, wow, the fact that there's so many books, I'm lazy. (laughs) I'm like, like, yeah, it's really impressive. And you're writing like a book again, like right currently right now, right? Yeah. I'm working on a new project that I'm tentatively calling adoption change makers, where I'm going to be highlighting, uh, adoptees, former foster youth, but professionals as well, adoptive parents like yourself. Um, and really just kind of highlight the collaborative effort that has been going into spearheading change. I, A lot of times my work is very heavy. I'm touching on the historical aspects of adoption, a lot of trauma involved in transracial adoption. But I also want to find the joy as well and celebrate the progress that we've made because, of course, like we wish it was faster, but a lot has changed and I see the forward progress when I'm working with agencies who are like, we need adoptee speakers, we need to collaborate more, we need to listen to former foster youth and the effect that that has on children is really like powerful. And I believe that if we are able to work together and highlight all the changes that we can do, then hopefully, you know, even more change can occur. So um, I've been working on edits with that with my agent. And so, you know, fingers crossed everything goes well. And I will be starting to do content around that on my podcast and social media channels as well, too. I cannot wait to support you in that (laughs) because I'm excited. That's just... Like we talk about often how it really, to make change, it takes everyone from the community. So it could never just be adopted parents. It could never just be first parents or birth parents. And it could never just be adoptees because Mm -hmm. often, sadly, people are always willing to listen to adoptive parents' voices but never adoptees, which sucks. And so we need to uplift y'all's voices um, so that way we can have changes that can make better changes for future adoptees or future former foster youth. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think just seeing the spark of just talking with my mom and talking with people in the community that I've had um, the opportunity to meet. And I've seen like adoptive parents, foster parents early in their journey. I've spoken to therapists who've been working with adoptees for years and years and years. And we're all like tied very closely. It's an emotional thing, thinking about children, children in need, children who need care and loving homes. Like we have a lot of passionate responses because Mm -hmm. that's natural, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So just finding a way that we all can work together and recognize that we need to focus on the most important aspect here, which is the children. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in my area, like as a social worker, I'm, I'm trained in amplifying lived experience and like the voices that are representative of the people that are most impacted, which is the adoptee themselves. Um, 
how do you feel the response is to that? So clearly that's your platform that you believe in building that community. You, what are some of the challenges or things that come <laughs> up when you try and say, Hey guys, shouldn't we be centering like the person that had no say in this or the person that, you know, what, how does that go for you? Uh, unfortunately feedback is typically like 50, 50. Um, there's a lot more support than I think like even just two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, but there is still a significant amount of negative feedback. Um, particularly if you're talking about adoption in anything, but a purely positive light, like even like the smallest crit, critique of the system um will have people just have their defenses put up and since a lot of us have had you know traumatic experiences and then adoptive parents and foster parents are dealing with challenges that come with being a parent and not having enough support being defensive is natural but it can get overwhelming as an adoptee trying to do work to help better <laughs> this system that has a lot of issues and the way my stance is is basically what we learn like history growing up if we don't learn from the past like history is going to repeat itself so we can't hide and shy away from the tough topics we need to address them and um one of the things that I, I've always been told by my mom, my adoptive mom, is like, I'm very blunt. Uh, and We love blunt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was diagnosed um, autistic um, in July. So I'm a late diagnosed autistic person as well. So my brain works a little bit differently. And sometimes like it's hard for me to, to sugarcoat. Uh, so I try to keep a balance, but sometimes it's just something is just really bad like we hear about people like ruby frank like how are you supposed to mm -hmm. you know navigate not hurting people but also addressing the huge concern and maltreatment of children it it's just one of those things where people want to see it as black and white but mm -hmm. there are a lot of shades of gray and there's a lot of nuance there and unfortunately you know people need to prioritize children and that means that adoptees like me and former foster youth like me are going to be pointing out the flaws and that hurts but if we don't hear it nothing's going to change mm -hmm. yeah and what led to for you like wanting to circle back and maybe heal that relationship with your mom was there resistance when you did find out and your parents in general what were some of like the cascade of emotions that you went through that were like, oh, this is like maybe a new worldview and perspective of myself that, yeah. what was that like for you <laughs> finding out at 19? Oh my gosh. It was a roller coaster and a 19 year old, like you're, you're already going through it all, figuring out how to adult in life. Um, I was in college and, uh, my initial like reaction was just like anger. I was so angry and it wasn't even for me, it wasn't like, oh, my mom's not my mom anymore. My dad's not my dad. It wasn't that. It was the fact that they lied about my identity and having struggled so much with that aspect throughout my entire life. Mm -hmm. I remember being five years old in kindergarten. And since we lived in the suburbs of New York, like the class was 95% white. And like right now I say like I'm a, I'm my winter shade, but I, I usually tan really dark. And as a kid, I spent a lot of times outdoors. So I remember a little girl came up to me and she was like, you can't play with me. You're brown. And I would go home after instances like that and talk to my parents. Like, why are people speaking to me like that? Why does this keep happening? People, as I got older, people would come up to me and speak in Spanish because they recognize, mm -hmm. you know, like when you're in that culture, you know, mm -hmm. you can really tell like who, who else is there. And it still happens to this day, but now I know Spanish, but growing up, it was very confusing. And then trying to talk to my parents, they're, was a disconnect where I couldn't understand why they thought it was okay mm -hmm. but there's another aspect of my story that isn't as common in adoptions because my parents are immigrants too so they immigrated from Italy and Portugal in their early teens so they grew up not speaking English they were teased um, my dad was called a slurs for Italians in school like it, they dealt with a lot of similar aspects that Latino immigrants deal with so when I came to them it was confusing to them as well because they're like oh, I dealt with that. Like, just ignore them. Yeah. And so, like, they didn't understand racism. Um, for them, like, I just posted a video of a conversation with my mom the other day where she was telling me that growing up, 
like slurs were racism. Like that's what their framework was. But understanding that little things like microaggressions, like uh, relatives talking about like immigrants coming to the country and stealing our jobs, like those things Mm -hmm. are like affecting me as a Latino immigrant who is part of this huge Italian family that says that they love me unconditionally. But I'm now 31 years old and I don't talk to most of the family and they don't talk to me either because... I refuse to sit silent and sit there uh, now, especially with two two children. Mm-hmm. I don't want to expose them to that, even if it's like a microaggression. It's not crazy overt forms of racism. So it's it's a really complicated dynamic. But eventually, uh, it was about a year after finding out, um, I started taking like cross cultural psychology classes and learning about racial identity development and the white identity development and the identity Mm -hmm. development of people of color. And I wrote about that in my book. And so I would come home on break from college and I chose the college as far away as possible. (laughs) I chose, I went to a SUNY Fredonia. So on break, I would come back and my parents and I would have these discussions at the uh, kitchen table and um, like my mom would make a big breakfast and then we just kind of have it out. <laughs> and it wasn't easy conversations. There was a lot of yelling. There was a lot of screaming and crying. But after I think us all like expressing our own opinions, I, I realized that, yeah, my parents do love me, but they still harmed me. And even though there were reasons and nuance to this, that doesn't erase the harm that they did to me as a child. And I never deserved that. Um, And people will always say, well, you had a roof over your head. You know, you had food. Like, you could have been left in the gutter. Like, these are comments that people leave Mm -hmm. and will say to me all the time. (laughs) So, and it's funny because other people, I think, um, have a hard time when they're first, like, doing content because getting those remarks is really hard. But these are things that I heard from my parents. Mm. They were like, well, would you have rather been left in the trash? Like, we saved you. Yeah. So my mom and dad, like, this is what they view as, like, Colombians in, like, the environment I would have grown up with. And they grew up in very poor areas in Italy and Portugal. So, like, Mm -hmm. very similar upbringings. But what was the difference there? They were able to immigrate into the United States. They had white privilege. They were able to assimilate. They were able to get good jobs get their dream of a white picket fence, own businesses, and become pretty successful. My family did not have, my other family, my birth family, did not have those opportunities. And one day I sat down and asked my mom, I was telling Gina about this the other day, Mm -hmm. I asked her, you had to quit high school so you could help support your family. You took care of your sisters, you were parentified, you had all these struggles growing up. And your parents weren't the best at all times. And you had a very uh, um, physical upbringing um, when it came to reprimanding. Would you have rather have been adopted into a different family where you didn't have to make these sacrifices, where you would have had every financial Mm -hmm. um, opportunity available to you? You could have become a stewardess like you wanted to. Would you have had that and not been with your family? She's like, no, I would never wish that. And that kind of was like a light bulb moment where she was like, wow, like that happened all, everything that I lost was now like real for her. She could understand it. Mm -hmm. And so now over these past years, after having so many conversations, she's really opened up. And, um, I think that's allowed us to heal. And of course, like my mom's not perfect. She, she makes mistakes. I make mistakes. We're human. We're going to have like opportunities where we we fight, but the, the important part now is that we listen to each other and we give each other space and respect boundaries. And unfortunately that's something that my dad never got good at. He passed away, um, back in 2020, I believe. Um, but he was headed in a better direction where than where he was, but he was like a huge Trump supporter and there were a lot of issues with that. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of has evolved (laughs) it just reminds me we talked about this how um there was a adoptee that i follow who said um being adopted doesn't give you a better life it just gives you a different life Mm -hmm. and that i feel like sometimes can be a hard pill to swallow for a lot of adoptive parents because they're always told that you gave them a better life Mm -hmm. you gave them a better life in reality 
there's no guarantee to that. Like all you did was give him a different life. And I think if more adoptive parents recognize that, that they wouldn't see themselves as, the, as a savior, that they would just see themselves as like other, like just like other biological parents, right? We're just trying, we should be in that child's life to help them, support them, be their parent, love them unconditionally, not the savior who saved them, yeah. to, pr- protected them from, sadly some people think like from their biological parents Mm -hmm. right because it's not like poverty or their nationality like it's still i'm saving them from something that's less than Mm -hmm. versus just different which what or other or yeah but i'm also thinking about what that does to a child because if you're saying i'm saving you from your nationality i'm saving you from your parents like the idea of like oh so there's something wrong with yep. who I am there's something wrong with my parents which also I'm from them that means there's something wrong with me or I'm saving you for x y and z you may be saying that in a way to make yourself better or to give them help them peace. feel grateful yeah. yeah peace of like why they were adopted but in reality I don't think it really truly does that now it it's like my parents, they they thought that just including me in their family would mean that I would feel unconditional love. And in a way, like I understand their intention, but that wasn't like the impact that it left. For me, I had to be completely whitewashed and stripped of my identity, my language, all the ties to my birth culture and my birth family to be accepted in my adoptive family. And if just seeing now how I'm treated versus how I used to be treated when I assimilated perfectly in, like that was acceptance and love. Now that I am me and accept that and love all of my cultures because I love my parents, Italian and Portuguese culture. I grew up like with my nono and nona, my grandparents on my dad's side. They watched us every weekend and I love the food. My dad was a chef, like Italian food, chicken parm, like all those things I love. But I missed out on a huge aspect of my culture and it made that love feel conditional. And as soon as I like walked home and like talked to my parents and said, I'm Colombian. And they looked at me like dead in the eyes and they said, no, you're not. You're Italian and Portuguese. You're our daughter. It was that ownership that they Mm -hmm. didn't get it. It made me feel like unworthy of any love. And I struggled with depression um, and anxiety, like really bad in college. And like the school counselors, they were not prepared for like the type of situation I had, but they tried their best. Mm -hmm. Um, But there was no support network that I had other than just Googling like adoptees. Like I found out I was adopted and I found like a few Facebook groups, but even in those, the adoptee community is split too. Cause some adoptees were like, Oh, I can't believe you did. Your parents did that. That's horrible. And the other were like, well, you, you're better off. Yeah. And it, it's that lack of acceptance that can cause even more harm. So if looking back for, uh, looking back as a child and seeing what your parents did, what do you wish that they would have done differently? Well, first things first is like honesty. Um, I feel like adoptive parents in general have a tendency to want to like sugarcoat situations and to kind of ease any potential harm that comes with being adopted. But the thing is like there is always going to be an aspect of loss and hiding that and not addressing that isn't going to make the situation better. It's an unfortunate reality that a lot of children are not able to be raised in their biological families or even like kinship adoptions and stuff like that. Adoptions are, I believe, are going to continue to happen, but we need to be more realistic and honest about the reasons why and understand that your child was placed for you with you for X, Y, and Z. But there are huge systemic issues that adoptive parents need to understand and realize and realize how they play into their role and how they learned about adoption. So just like... Uh, what was education what, how, what education, do you wish they had done? Done differently. yeah so i think just like education and just wanting to take that next step 
because I feel like as parents in our day to day lives, like we have to get our kids up for school. We got to make sure that they bathe and they get a nutritious meal. And then we got after school programs. We have sports. We have a chorus. We have all these things. It's easy to get overwhelmed in this day to day life. But when you have an adopted child or a foster child in your home, there are unique challenges that Mm -hmm. a typical child that is in their biological home are not going to face. And it, it's just something that's not going to go away. So it's just like being very honest with yourself and with your family and don't be afraid to ask for help and mm-hmm. keep treat, keep pushing for more resources and help from like your community. There is a huge network now that is available. There's classes that you can take online. There's podcasts that you can listen to. There are so many different things that parents don't have the excuse that they did like mm-hmm. 10, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I like to hit the point of like what you said about like the different needs that your child who's an adoptee compared to like your biological children. Cause I have both. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, I often talk about on my platform how like I love all of my kids. Right. Yeah. But I do have to treat them differently because if I were to just look at tiger and just say, well, you know, you don't really need therapy or you don't need I'm gonna X, do the Y, same and C. Thing I do. I'm going to do the same thing I did for your sister because if she doesn't need it, why do you need it? Mm-hmm. And that would be so harmful for her because it would be kind of like ignoring the big things that she's like desperately needing, right? Like she may need extra help. She may need, like we buy a lot of books talking. Well, I love to buy books from adoptees who've written books. And one of our favorite is uh, Adoption is Both. Yeah. And I love this book because I remember the first time she read it, she was like, oh, I don't feel like any type of way. I was like, okay. I'm like, But later on, you may feel a different way. Mm-hmm. And then later on, she expressed that she did feel differently. And she felt comfortable with telling me that. I mean, there was more to it, but like being able to have the books and the resources to allow her to f- be feel comfortable with talking to me or even maybe she may not like she may not feel comfortable with talking to me with some things but allowing people who I can trust like a therapist like close friends who are very educated on these things that she could go to and talk to that it doesn't have to just be me Mm -hmm. that she should have someone there so that she can talk to freely so that way she can be able to heal Mm -hmm. maybe not completely heal but just go on because i don't know if it's like it's trauma i don't know if it's you ever really heal from it like how do you ever just completely heal from losing your parents but at least just i don't know what's the best word but i just want to make sure that she can talk to someone without ever feeling like she has to hold back and that may mean that she may not be able to talk to me and drew Mm -hmm. but i want to make sure that she has the resources education and the right people to talk to yeah and like those conversations when children are young are so important and it's just like anything else that you teach your kids it's a skill that needs to be developed and if you don't give your children the vocabulary and the space and the tools to express themselves in a healthy way they are not going to know how to do that. And a lot of adoptive families will struggle with challenging behaviors from adoptees and former foster youth. And it's, you have to think like, did they have appropriate behaviors modeled? Like, did you show them healthy ways to deal with their anger or are they just moving back to like what they saw in the home before they came to your home and just having like little things like books and moments where you're just having these open conversations even if it's just like watching a movie together and you you know just reflect with them afterwards showing that you are giving people other adoptees and other foster youth space to acknowledge and validate their feelings is showing your child that you will be there to support them as their feelings develop as they grow older and have new perspectives on their stories because like if you asked me 10 years ago how I felt about adoption it was very conflicted like I was in one camp I was like well adoption uh lying about adoption is horrible but if it wasn't for adoption I would have been on the street somewhere and I like because all I knew about adoption was from what I saw in media from like little orphan Annie and stuff like that I I wasn't really quite out of the fog um but finding out like pushed me and sped up my journey so um just figuring out all that language by myself finding those resources by myself was very isolating and stressful and that just compounded the trauma as it went I imagine if I was like a adoptive 
parent, it feels to me that I would have this desire possibly, hopefully not, but I can feel it like as you're talking ebbing up that I might have an inclination without this education to control the narrative for my child in part because I want to protect them, but also in part to protect myself. Mm -hmm. Like I can feel that I would be afraid if I already hadn't, um, healed and worked through Mm -hmm. and had my own safe spaces to say, what if my child rejects me? Like, what if I'm not enough? What if they feel other than what if, so I'm going to like overcompensate on Mm -hmm. pretending that nothing has happened Mm -hmm. because I actually am nervous to have a conversation where they say like, I wish I had stayed with like my first mom. I wish I'd stayed with my birth mom or why you, or when they're angry, they throw it in my face. Mm -hmm. And like, Mm -hmm. I don't even want to be here. You don't even love me the same. Like all my actual deepest fears as a parent, Mm -hmm. the more your child knows, it feels like they can use that as a weapon against me. And I think some small part of me would want to protect both of us from that. Mm -hmm. Do you see that in like aversions to education or defensiveness like oh yeah I feel like that's almost a natural response that just saying it out loud just like say it that maybe that's part of your journey that Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's so difficult I think because adoptive parents are so often held on like a pedestal where like you're supposed to be this picture perfect family that takes care of these kids that saves them and gives them all these opportunities and with that there are a lot of like privileged elements of it but also there's a lot of pressure Mm -hmm. and people forget that adoptive and foster parents are parents they're humans they're gonna feel it's okay if your daughter comes home one day slams the door and says you're not my real mom for you to go to your room and cry like that hurts Mm-hmm. I remember the first time my oh, my son said, like, I hate you. Like, mm-hmm. you're the worst mom ever. Like, that hurts. Mm-hmm. As a parent, like, when you love your children, you put everything, every part of your soul in being into it. And hearing those things, like, makes you instinctually feel like, oh, did I fail them? Did I do something wrong? Yeah. Oh, no. Like, it's my problem. And, you know, it's natural to want to defend yourself and be like, well, no, you can't say that to me. Um, Who would you be without me? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's why it's so important why I stress like pre-adoption education because you're inevitably going to end up in these t- very difficult positions and if you have no concept of like what may come you're just going to be reacting in that moment but by educating yourself early on listening to other adoptees views like you can see that some adoptees like they have an amazing family they are very happy they they love being adopted some people did not have a great family still love their family and wish adoption was abolished and there are so many different like sides of the spectrum that adoptees and foster youth can land on and you never know Mm -hmm. where your child is going to fall as they grow up so it's being open to that and understanding that just putting yourself in your child's shoes like what do you wish your parents would have done like Mm -hmm. growing up how would you have felt more supportive and like of course you're going to have to adapt it to like trauma and needs for like mental health and physical health and all those things but it's just one step taking that opportunity to learn to listen and even just like talk to your child and say like hey like i i know that you were upset what you said really hurt me but i want to understand like where that's coming Mm -hmm. from is there something that i did is there something that you want me to do or do you want to talk about your birth parent maybe we can set up a visit there are different things that you can do to approach the situation because i don't think any parent should lie to their kids because kids are very intuitive. They pick up on our mm-hmm. parents' feelings. And mm-hmm. if you're sad or you're angry, your child will know. Mm-hmm. And saying like, oh yeah, it's fine. You can say that to me. Like they're going to know. <laughs> they're going to read between the lines. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is a lot of adoptees will push that down because we don't want to make our parents mm-hmm. feel bad. Yeah. I love my mom. People don't understand, but me and her, like we're best friends. We talk almost every single day and they don't understand that it can be really hard for me to approach these conversations with her because I don't want to hurt her. Yeah. I know that in my heart and in her heart, she did the best that she could with the information that she had at the time. But like I said earlier, like you can't ignore the past. Otherwise, it's going to repeat itself. So it's like underdeveloped societal feelings about big feelings Mm -hmm. contributes to this like you're doing it wrong hush hush we only want to feel positive feelings about one topic Mm -hmm. the very first thing you said was like these layers of gray and this nuance that's around 
really every element of life that yeah. if, if your maturity level, honestly, it doesn't allow you to accept the fact that there's probably significant gray and nuance, like at least to the person's perception or why they made the choice they did or why your kid's upset or whatever it may be. I just think that's one of the most harmful elements for all parties involved is like, yeah. we're only going to see it from my view or we're only going to see it from the child's view or whatever it may be without like taking a moment to say, tell me more or get curious mm -hmm. or yeah well I just think about like because like even hearing you say that stuff I'm like I've always like tr I'm always trying to prepare myself right and like I already told myself a long time ago if she were to get to that point that like it's not about me it's about all the things that she's been through all the trauma she's been through and like I need to just kind of like recognize that mm -hmm. and then be there for her like I I'm always going to be older I'm her parent that I will be able to find the resources is be able to handle my stuff um, but not put that on her but it's still really hard like yeah. i don't want i don't want her like not love i love her like i want us to be like besties i want to be besties with all my kids but it's not about being best friends with them i mean that's an extra cherry on top but it is really about like being their parent and supporting them mm -hmm. because like nothing hurts more not is not having that support you know mm -hmm. and so like even hearing you say that i'm like oh my goodness like i was like i thought it was cool i thought it was good and i'm like no i don't want That'll it to happen hard. yeah but like it's it really is about loving your child so much that you don't want it but then often not re recognizing that we because we're trying to put our wants we're not putting our kids wants and needs first like we're putting our wants and that's not what we should do as parents and yeah i was gonna say are there that's so like honest and so do you are there support networks that are like being built for families because gina still deserves to have a space to go to say that was incredibly hard for me. I feel like I'm failing sometimes. It was actually like all my hopes of the effort I put in are feeling challenged right now. Like, mm -hmm. it, like, do you just wreck individual therapy or like, so if you're cultivating a, um, youth space, like what does that look like if someone's listening, they're the parent and they're like, oh, I want to put my kid first, but like, I don't feel like I can really, if my kid, my cup's empty or I have all these big feelings, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not able to actually be there for my kid. And I'm able to know that, but now what, like, what would you yeah. say? I, I feel like it's super important for parents to have a safe support network. Uh, I definitely recommend like all adoptive and foster parents go to therapy at some point, because, you know, even if you had the best childhood growing up, like just understanding how you work, how you cope with things will help you down the road and when you have these situations with your children you have these big feelings it's you have to find an appropriate way where you can let that out in a safe place and what I see a lot <laughs> recently with the uptick of social media is we'll have ad adoptive parents go online to try to find community and be like oh hey like I'm struggling I adopted a kid and I don't know what to do I don't know what to do with their hair this and that because they didn't do the work beforehand mm -hmm. to create that network and it's like well if you knew a baby was going to come into your house like you would have bare necessities of like a crib and you know bottles or you know like milk donation whatever way you would feed clothe and shelter your baby those are things that you have in mind but when you're adopting a child there are further steps that you have to take and mm -hmm. understand that it is going to be very emotionally charged at certain instances you are going to be overwhelmed you're dealing with raising a baby or a toddler or a preteen whatever uh, the child's age and additional challenges so if you don't have a therapist if you don't have a strong communication skills with your spouse these things are just going to compound on and on mm -hmm. and on and on and on and then you're going to lash out and then you're going to get defensive and then you're not going to be the best parent that you possibly could be yeah. and then that's where we see a lack of like uh trauma-informed and child-centered care mm -hmm. and i think a lot of agencies and um different organizations are now starting to see the importance of not just um one or two classes they're seeing like post-adoption classes and pre-adoption classes and you can connect with other moms and i really recommend doing like group chats there are some good facebook groups but facebook can get mm -hmm. <laughs> difficult at sometimes but i think all adoptive parents and foster parents should have like at least one to two other like parents that they can confide in and know that they're not going to share that information with the world yeah. um, because 
if you're just turning to social media or, you know, like blogging everything that happens in your family, that, then you are exposing your family to other issues as well. Yeah. Yeah. So have a cult, like curating safe spaces yeah. to do your own healing so you can offer your child the space they need to heal. Mm-hmm. So you talk about being a late discovery adoptee and then also finding that you are a transracial adoptee. Can you talk about finding your identity and finding like about your culture and like who you are now knowing more about yourself? Yeah. I mean, it was really awkward at first because like logically I understood that like oh I'm Latina I'm I'm multiracial but what does that mean and going to like being in college and learning about different people's like schemas and uh stereotypes that you learn kind of forms how you view different cultures and different people so all I knew was like a lot of racist beliefs from my childhood and knowing that those things were wrong and I didn't know like what was real like what were like aspects of the culture other than like speaking Spanish and reggaeton <laughs> like I always loved uh, uh Spanish music and stuff like that uh, but I didn't even like I didn't even have rice and beans I never had like a taco like I literally had nothing <laughs> from my cultural ties so it started off small I remember joining Latinos Unidos in college it was like a Latino um society and just walking in that room and seeing everybody and I felt like the biggest imposter there mm-hmm. I didn't fit in and then of course people are gonna ask like where are you from I'm like oh I'm from Colombia oh like tell me about your parents and then you know like my story isn't easy <laughs> like it takes yeah. like an hour to <laughs> unwrap everything so I I just had to kind of slowly but surely uh find things that like were fun and brought joy that I could stick with and since my dad was a chef like I always like always was obsessed with food so I started exploring different recipes um I started making empanadas and like the first few times complete disaster (laughs) I didn't even know how to like cut open a platano and like it was a disaster like it's not easy no it is not and if you've never done it before like I tried to like cut it open it came out like pieces chunks off like it was horrible it looked like I did some kind of torture experiment to it but it's like those things that other Latinos they grow up with like their parents mm-hmm. in the kitchen and helping them and ironically enough like I married a half Colombian man so mm. I was able to learn more about the culture as we started like dating now we've been together like almost 12 years now mm. um and learn more from him and he wasn't fluent in Spanish but he traveled back to Colombia with his family a lot and he got to tell me stories and just it It helped me find the joy and feel less of an imposter. And I think one of the things that a lot of transracial adoptees have in common with like biracial and multiracial people is that feeling of like, I am too much of this, but not enough of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's at different opportunities um, that I'll be like, oh, well, I'm doing this great. And then, oh no, (laughs) five steps back and I'm feeling awkward. I feel like I don't belong. I don't know who to turn to. And it just takes a lot of like time and practice to get comfortable with. It's kind of like learning a new skill. Mm -hmm. And then I also had to face like a lot of internalized racism because I felt that because of the stereotypes I grew up in, like the racism I heard in my day-to-day life I had to figure out that those things were wrong and like I knew they were wrong logically but that doesn't like make those feelings just go away because for me it was like okay I'm I'm Latina but my parents don't want me to identify that as that why Mm -hmm. like it went so far where like they hid scholarships that were like Hispanic heritage scholarships they hid them and would throw them out so I couldn't apply to them and it's like all these like missed opportunities felt like I missed like a huge part of who I was and who Mm -hmm. I could have been and like my parents they spoke many languages they knew Spanish they could have easily taught me that growing up and it's just like little things like that where I could continue to be like really sad about it I am at times but now finding the joy I think as a parent that has really influenced me to like really buckle down and learn more about my culture so I can share it with my kids Mm -hmm. and Gina and I were talking about this but like 
adoption doesn't stop with the adoptee like my kids now have questions like they're like well why is your family in Colombia why do you have two sets of mommies like why they have mm-hmm. a lot of questions and they're only eight and six and a half so like this affects their their lives and their future generations of children if they choose to have them and it's just something that I am trying to do the best that I can so I can support my kids so they will have always have that love and appreciation for their culture and let me tell you it's something really special where like my son he had a concert at school and he wanted to wear his little poncho with his little <laughs> uh horse on it and then they have their Colombian jerseys like just them just knowing their their culture and all their parts and like my husband he's half Irish so we were in the Irish day parade too so like cool. Those moments make it really special and just kind of, it's kind of like healing that intergenerational trauma with me by Mm -hmm. like reparenting myself as I parent my kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. (laughs) What do you feel like adoptive parents could do to help further support their children if like their child was a transracial adoptee to further be part of their culture, but also helping that child be more part of that culture that they've been kind of stripped away from. Yeah. I think one of the easiest things to do is find like the niche of that culture that brings you authentic joy. Because when you show that like you're authentically interested in like the music or the food or like the dancing, like your child will pick up on that Mm -hmm. and want to be more involved with it. Because I see so often parents will be like, well, I asked them if they wanted to take a language class. Uh, Okay. That that was it. Like kids, they don't, sometimes they don't want to do things. Like Mm -hmm. even if it's good for them, they're not going to want to do things. That's the same as true as like for an adoptee who was adopted into another culture. And sometimes they need that little extra push. And so I try to like practice what I preach. So like with the Irish of the St. Patrick's Day parade, let me tell you, like that was a nightmare for like (laughs) loud noises, like people everywhere. That was like my like worst nightmare to do. And I'm like, well, no, I have to do it. But like, there has to be like something that I enjoy about it. My kids get to dress up. They get to to go to a party afterwards. There, there are things that even though I'm nervous, and even though it can be scary for uh, parents to take that step, take that lunge and then worrying about doing something wrong or saying something wrong or looking different. Like I was a Latina in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Like there was a bunch of white people, red hair and stuff. And like, it felt really awkward at first. Mm -hmm. I felt left out. But if adoptive parents don't like push themselves to get out of their comfort zone, they are not gonna support their kids. And if you just think as a parent, how awkward and uncomfortable you are as an adult, adult with a lot of life experience how do you think your six-year-old is gonna feel Mm -hmm. how do you think your preteen is gonna feel like they're going through hormones and all that stuff yeah they're Mm -hmm. already vulnerable if you aren't there to support them and show them like how to have a good time like they're not gonna know how to do that and just like with like reading a book if you didn't sit there and learn the basics you would never be able to open up and understand that beautiful story and like get to hear about cinderella and all that stuff the same thing is true like if you don't build this foundation with your kids it's not gonna get easier as you go so you have to just kind of throw yourself in there and get out of your comfort zone and I think that's that's I'm seeing more of it now with adoptive parents which is good it kind of reminds me of this uh I've given a couple keynotes like speak um speaking like gigs I don't know what I call them (laughs) But one you of think the gig and Gina, gig and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember telling a lot of adoptive parents who are like, I, you know, I don't know what to do, and I'm like, I mean, it could start as simple, be, or it could start as being as simple as becoming friends with someone of the same race or ethnicity mm-hmm. as your child and having a genuine friendship yes that's like not just like being friends with them like oh i have this friend i have this black friend and like no like i think i even remember i don't know if you were there but i was like it has to be you it has to be so much of a genuine friendship that if you were to crap your pants <laughs> and you needed to call this friend up and be like i need you to come like i'm stuck in bring my house bring me something fresh bring me yeah. something fresh like i want that type of genuine friendship because your child will see that and yes. they will also i mean not only will you be able to through being friends with them learn more about your child's culture and like little things that you pick up on when you have a friend that it's really close to you but it's so different because they live so different than you did from childhood or whatever that if you're able being friends with them and picking up on little things like that yeah you begin to 
will be able to also tell your kids certain things about that that you could only get through a real genuine friendship Mm -hmm. and so it could be something as simple as like just having meeting someone becoming friends with them and like that i think can make a world of a difference your child seeing that and be like oh man like I don't know. I just feel like that can do something not only for your child, but for yourself as well. Yeah. And I, when adoptive parents, like, um, if you've seen like the Colin Kaepernick documentary, mm-hmm. document, um, Colin in black and white, like the, the mother at one point goes up to, um, a, a black woman and a black man and they're like, and she's asking about the hairstyle and she doesn't know the appropriate name for it. And she doesn't really have much of a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. It was immediately, like, transactionary. She didn't want, like, to, to find out more about them and learn how, who they are as people, their hobbies, whatever. She wanted something mm-hmm. for them. And I tell adoptive parents, like, your child should not be the first black person, the first Asian person, the first Latino person in your family or in your close circle. Like, if that is, you're already doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. And you have to reflect on why you want to adopt a child of another race when you don't even have authentic relationships with people in that community and like what can you offer because there are plenty there are plenty of people out there who are looking to adopt babies and infants and i think the stats show from gretchen sisson's book relinquished that it's about 55 couples to one baby slash Mm -hmm. newborn available so like there are a lot of families out there and if you're just thinking like oh let me perfect my profile oh i want to get like the the baby as soon as possible so i'm going to open up my doors to all races and all disabilities and all this stuff like are you in it for the right reasons Mm -hmm. is this about you or is this about the child and i think like I said, like I think more people are starting to get it, but it's still it's still slow progress. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of someone a long time ago. I want to say it's been years now. Came up to me and they asked us, like, how was it adopting a child of a different race? And I was really honest with them, and I told them the great things, but then the not so great things, right? The questioning, the looks, and stuff like that. And um, she's like, you know this woman who dealt with infertility was like, well, I'm open to any, any child of any race. And the spouse or her husband was kind of like, I'm not. And it felt really weird, but also I was really happy that he was able to recognize that Mm -hmm. because what, what would have been for that child who would have been of a different race that this dad would have not wanted this child in this home, but only wanted a child. Mm -hmm. Right. And I wanted a specific child. And, like, as, it may sound bad. It may sound weird. But if you know that you may not feel comfortable of a, a child of a certain race or you are okay with them being little but not okay with them being an adult, like a teenager mm-hmm. or, like, a preteen of that race and you feel very uncomfortable, then that child may not be for you. And that would save this child but also you from years of heartache and trauma if you're able to just be very true with your thoughts and your and and your feelings about that because well i know it sounds really bad for this guy to say like i wouldn't be okay with any race i mean him being able to say that and them not choosing to adopt a child of certain races that he was not comfortable with really just saves the child and i think that's the most important thing yeah exactly and like one of the common like critiques i get from people who see my content or read my book it's like you're scaring people away from adopting Mm -hmm. and i'm like if knowledge and information and education about this topic is what scares you away good it should scare you away because it's not going to get easier from here Mm -hmm. like i'm a stranger who researched for years and used peer-reviewed articles and interviews with other adoptees and foster youth and adoptive parents like i created all this information to help parents be better at transracial adoption um but if you aren't even able to sit with a book in your own home in your own comfort level like how are you going to deal with a conversation with your child when they're really mad at you and you're really mad at them they came home late from a party or something and they're saying something and they had a really bad experience and now you're supposed to be there for them And you can't even handle like just sitting there reading a book. Mm -hmm. And there are so many parents who just, it's not in their wheelhouse to uh, care for kids with certain disabilities or certain races. They didn't have 
the education and support growing up. They are ignorant to certain issues. And that's the unfortunate reality. And we're not all going to be good at the same things. And I think listening and learning your own limitations as a parent helps you become a better parent Mm -hmm. and being able to say like I think it takes a lot of courage for that man to be like I am not comfortable with transracial Mm -hmm. adoption now it could be just because you know like there's a lot of racism in his family Mm -hmm. I don't know or it could be because he knows that he doesn't have ties to that culture he doesn't feel equipped enough so I look at that as an opportunity knowing that you're not prepared right now gives you that opportunity to take the steps to get prepared. Right. Mm -hmm. Versus I kind of, I don't think I need to know that. Mm -hmm. That's not relevant to me. All I have to do is love. Like the, all of those seem like they're just less open to the feedback of the people that are impacted educators that have researched like lived experience, other parents that are saying, Hey, we're five steps ahead and it gets a little muddy. Yeah. (laughs) It's a little (laughs) tricky. If you're like, no, I'm just going to love them so hard that that won't be for me. I think, yeah, leads to a lot of complications. Oh yeah. So at least the door was cracked by saying, I don't really know about that. Like, good. You probably shouldn't know. Mm -hmm. You probably should have a ton of questions and be really hesitant and probably, need a lot of education if you're being honest with yourself (laughs) yeah yeah and I feel like our generation is now like really aware of intergenerational trauma Mm -hmm. and like realizing that certain parenting choices that our parents did weren't the best and like caused harm and now like reflecting on that like a lot of us I think are like trying to do better and like even just like dads like dads are way more involved in this generation than ever before Before. like why is that because we are now knowledgeable that like having both parents be interactive with kids and like having a really strong bond is helping the children develop and like just things like that we we learn from past history mistakes so that we just got to continue like taking those right steps and asking for help I feel like There aren't enough resources for adoptive parents and foster parents. And even if like professionals, like there are so many professionals who are swamped and don't have support networks, but adoptive parents and foster parents have a lot of power here. Mm -hmm. And people, I think, forget that the adoption industry is a multi-billion dollar business in America. And if you just like going to the store and you saying like, oh, I'm not going to buy this product because it doesn't align with my beliefs. It's very problematic. It's dangerous. Every purchase is a vote. And so if you think of adoption in that same type of way, you choose which agency you're going to work with. You choose if you're going to work with a lawyer or facilitator or, you know, um, a, a, which hire t- an educator, mm-hmm. re- purchase someone's book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like there are so many things that you can do now that will help the, the agencies and the industry become more accountable because if they see adoptive parents standing up, sending them emails and being like, we need more resources. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, are you just going to focus on getting a kid as fast as possible? Or are you going to push that agency? to get those resources so when you do have a child you have that support network and your child will have that support network and the birth family will have Mm -hmm. that support network Mm -hmm. because if you aren't doing that why 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 would they when they're making millions of dollars Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so we have loved to have you here on this couch with us chit chat and tell our followers how they can find you um, on all the social media platforms. And then I want them to know about your books because <laughs> I love your books. Thank you. Um, you can find me at adoptethoughts.com. That's my website. All my social medias are uh, adoptee underscore thoughts. Uh, I have a podcast, same name, if you just Google me. Um, and I think Gina's going to put all the links in the um, mm-hmm. description. My first two adoption books are What White Parents Should Know About Transracial Adoption and the accompanying workbook. You don't need the first one to learn from the workbook but Mm -hmm. it is beneficial to have that um most local libraries have them if you don't want to purchase a copy it's a great way to support is just request a copy from Mm -hmm. your local library and just follow me on my social media channels to keep up to date on my next book which hopefully we'll be hearing more about that soon um yeah thank you so much for having me i really enjoyed this conversation it's always great to to sit down with you guys and chat yeah thank you so much and for sharing so transparently and with a lot of compassion thank you so much so my segment today is from like kind of lived experience Mm -hmm. it's something that worked really well for me and my house but also something my mom talks about that she did with her mom that really changed things and it is using writing letters and journal writing specifically to facilitate 
the like self healing, but also the parent relationship. So the thing I'm bringing forward is as, um, in relation to today's topic or just any topic that's challenging, providing a safe space that feels private to your child for them to process their emotions Mm -hmm. can be a really nice offering to give as a parent. So maybe I just am learning that I have a lot of growth to do in an area, whatever it may be, gifting in a special way, a journal and a little set of colored pens, age appropriate, whatever it's going to be, and giving that to your child and saying like, this is where you can write absolutely anything your dreams what's hurting you questions you have whatever you want Mm -hmm. and you get to decide is this a a private space that nobody else in this household has access to Mm -hmm. you deserve having that and I'll never come read it I won't you know look in there this is your private spot to have things and you or you can use it to help you remember things that eventually maybe when you've calmed down or whatever maybe you do want to bring up Mm -hmm. to me or your other parent or whoever are supportive adults in your life you can choose to share things that are in this journal so you don't forget them or you can like work through them a little bit but this is a safe tool for you Um, the second piece of and then having your own as Mm -hmm. a parent So like, where are you writing down? I'm completely overwhelmed. I feel like I'm failing or I'm loving this so much. I want to have 25 more kids wherever you're at in your journey. Do you have a spot to document that that feels safe to you that you can choose to either share or not, even with your partner? Do you have somewhere to vent, to share? Um, So encouraging journal writing in general. But then there's this other layer I wanted to introduce Mm -hmm. of letter writing. So... I've utilized this personally. I've written letters to myself. So I've written letters to my child self. I've written letters to um, my body. I've written letters, any area that I feel I need to heal. I've written apology letters, the letters of frustration and anger. Um, I've done a wide variety of things with those letters. I've burned them. I've kept them in my journals. I've given them to someone after Mm -hmm. sitting on it for a while. Um, that's a practice that I've done. That's helped me gosh so much feel like I can just get some things out that I've always wanted or needed to say. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, letter writing, across the parent child relationship. So my mom shares with me, this isn't something that I ever did with my parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had other check-in times. It was never really letter writing, but my mom with her mom, whenever something had gone down, that was difficult to debrief from, maybe they'd had a big blowout. Maybe someone had traveled for a week and they hadn't like the ships were sailing in the night, right? Like there's no, um, real, connection time like that was lacking Mm -hmm. then she had the opportunity for her mom would write her and say like hey amy i know how that went down i said things i maybe regret i really love you and care about you i'm thinking about you today and leave it on her pillow Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. hey can we touch base i miss you let's do an activity write me back and let me know what you want to do this weekend i'm all ears like these little notes where it wasn't confrontational my mom was like from my personality type I needed that. I loved that she would let me come to her Mm -hmm. in my own way. And she was like, and so often I just wanted to write her back. So I would write and say like, I'm not ready to forgive you yet. That was really hurtful. Or like, thanks so much for saying that. I, I, you know, I miss you too. Or Mm -hmm. here's how that impacted me. And they had this pen pal relationship that, My mom was like, that was my lifeline through my parents' divorce, their separation, them getting back together, high school, like so many tumultuous times. My mom and I had this little intimate thing between us that felt really special. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to put that forward as something that I've benefited from, your child may benefit from in a parenting practice that may be helpful in your home. Yeah, I love that. We So our child's um, therapist has already had our child already has a um like a journal that they can write in and like i'm huge on like privacy yeah because i remember my mom reading my journal and like you should be able to express certain things like i mean i've even had times where I, panda has not said the nicest things ever but he's in his room being able to express it and i like i remember he was not like super quiet and like said something but like i never even like confronted that confronted that because yeah. there's no reason because of the fact like kids should be able to express things and and it's really important to be able to express it um and then also just feel like oh, like because you, you have frustration sometimes and so i love the fact like um like the journal part where your kid can share if they want to yeah. or they cannot and that's okay but also just being the parent to like really like accept that and like not open it not read it um because i mean people shouldn't be able to have that like kids should be able to have that um and so i think that's really cool but i've never even thought about like the 
the notes or letters back and forth. I think that's so cute because it's like it reminds me of like high school when you're writing little notes to your friends. Like nothing feels better to like get a little note. Yeah, it feels special. Mm -hmm. And in a big family, my mom's one of five. And, you know, this is something I would consider if I were to have kids. It just you can feel a little lost in the mix with a big family and something about your parent taking time to be like, hi, you, your name, here are my thoughts. I really care about you, mm -hmm. especially on difficult topics. Mm -hmm. Like I really regret something that I did, or I really have something to say and I'm feeling embarrassed about it, but I still want you to know. So I'm going to go out of my way to say it anyways. And this makes me feel more comfortable. It kind of opens this other venue of communication mm -hmm. that teaches your child. It's okay to feel really embarrassed and overwhelmed mm -hmm. about feeling like regret you have in a relationship or whatever it is it's I think it's a really healing tool that could yeah. be used oh, yeah well I'm gonna start the letter like it's my cute. kiddos I think it's just I don't know what it is it just seems so cute the end of the like you said the making sure that you're writing to that one individual making them feel special it's important I like that yeah so that was a wonderful episode I felt like wow like going back and thinking about everything that Melissa said and like the conversations, I don't even feel like we hit on everything that I wanted to. We could talk for weeks. I just, yeah, there's so much to learn and be discussed. Mm -hmm. Cause like there was like, I wanted to talk about microaggressions. Cause like, I think that's really hard for, I think people in general to understand, but especially adoptive parents, like sometimes you're like, well, I never said like this or this, mm -hmm. like, what do they mean? I felt like we didn't even get to talk about, like there's so many things that I feel like we didn't get to talk about. And it stinks that we only have so much time and so I feel like we're probably gonna, just gonna have to have Melissa come back or something that's what I feel like and totally Melissa other voices other people mm -hmm. like having ongoing conversations that challenge you to think critically about your own experience and someone's experience that maybe you've never considered mm -hmm. I'm here for it day in and day out it's conversations worth having mm -hmm. so I'm just I'm thrilled she could join us too. supporting adoptees is so important so if you guys can just give her a follow up that would be so great but even if you just have questions we'll make sure that those questions get answered in the comments bye guys